by uh, the Father. Um, we are, I'm hoping to hustle through this doctrine of the Bible, because we are coming up on, I think, probably February or March, two years that it's taken us to go through it, so being able to get on uh, to something else that the Lord would be leading. Um, you probably, if you've got uh, all the notes from what we've gone through, you should be on about page 71 or 72. We were here last week. We didn't get anywhere though last week, did we? On it, it didn't seem like. So, hopefully, we can move through this morning. After this little section here, I think the next ones to complete uh, what we're looking at in proofs that the Bible is the Word of God that we'll get through and and get completed. But you should have all the notes. So. If you have opportunity at some time to disciple somebody, you can sit down with them and be able to go through the doctrine of the Bible with them. And, you know, it seems like for me when I go over things again, I learn more that I didn't know or didn't catch the first time through. And especially if you begin to teach it, and you begin to teach it, you know it in a different uh, level, it seemed like, than you did before. So... Well, we've looked at the supernatural unity, looking at those proofs that the Bible is real. Supernatural unity of the Bible, right? It's, it's unified. It doesn't uh, talk against itself. It's indestructible. Even though Satan's tried the best to get rid of it, you can't destroy it. It will not be destroyed. We looked at historical and archaeological accuracy to prove that it's real. Scientific accuracy. And now we're looking at the prophetic accuracy of the Bible, and we looked at the nation of Israel, and uh, this morning we're going to begin to look at uh, some of the Gentile nations or Canaanite nations that uh, came from the prophecy that uh, Noah did back there in the Old Testament in Genesis. We hit that a little bit of that if you were at the Monday Bible study at the Manor. I kind of got on a little bit of that again, and we were talking about some of those things. So. I want to look at Edom a little bit here. In Edom, who was the person that started the area called Edom? Somebody help me with it. Somebody looked ahead and know. If you need any of the sheets, they're in the back too. If anybody needs uh, uh, to follow along with where we are. Does anybody need one? Kyler can get one if you don't. Raise your hand if you need one. If you don't have one. Okay, Kathy needs one. You need one up this way you guys got? You got? You need one up here too? Okay. Alan and Marsha that way. We probably won't cover all of it this morning. I want to spend a little time with this section too. Um, so Edom, who was it that went and settled the area that became known as Edom or the Edomites? Esau. Esau did that. And let's look at a a scripture that just kind of tells us that in uh, Genesis 36. Verse 1 says, Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of uh, Elon, the Hittite, and Aholiah Bama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zib Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, or Nebajoth. Hard names, why didn't somebody else read that? I like to give that to somebody else to read. <laughs> those are hard, especially when you haven't read through it beforehand a little bit more to be able to get those down. Um, but we see who, who was one of uh, Esau's wives, the very last one we see here. Anybody pick up on that? Who is it? Verse 3. Ishmael's daughter, right? Ishmael's daughter. So Esau ends up marrying into the line of who? The Ishmaelites, right? Esau married into the Ishmaelites. And we know that they were 
the two nations, right, Israel and uh, the Arabs or Ishmaelites were going to be great nations, right? We look at that from Shem or the line of, the line of Shem. And years after this nation, uh, they, what they did is they refused, after they become a nation, Israel wanted to do something to kind of come through their land as they're going up into the promised land. And what do you think those, what do you think those Edomites did? Did they let them through? They what? They attacked them. They wouldn't let them through. I want to go to Numbers uh, 20, and we'll see a little bit of that if we read a little bit later on after they became that nation. Numbers 20, starting in verse 14. I'll read uh, just down through a few here. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. So Jacob's name became who? Israel. So we were talking Israel. And Esau became Edom. Or we can refer to him as Esau or a lot of times as Edom. So here they are, right here, verse 15 says, Now our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt for a long time, or a long time. And the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, Neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway. And if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people, with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore, Israel turned away from him. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. So Esau would not let his brother or those people through. Remember when we said, we've got to be careful how we treat who? Israel. We've got to be careful how we treat the Israel of God, his chosen people. Well, what happens to Edom because of the way he treated them? Well, God pronounced judgment upon Edom according to several prophecies. And these are true. They've come to pass, at least. Uh, we know uh, that first little bullet thing, their commerce was ceased. Not only that, but their people would become extinct. The Edomites, who hears of Edomites today? Anybody? Don't hear of the Edomites today like we did. Also, their land was to be desolate. The land would become desolate. That's what God pronounces upon them. Now, I want to read a couple from uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and probably Malachi, just to show a few of those things with some of the prophecy. Jeremiah 49, 17 says, Also Edom shall be a desolation. Every one that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at the, all the plagues thereof. And verse 18, As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. Speaking about the desolation of it, Ezekiel 35, not far from where we are. Three, 
3 through 7. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, which is also uh, Edom, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth out, and him that returneth. So here we see the desolation again that he prophesies, and we could look at all of the book of Obadiah speaks of it. All of Obadiah speaks of it. Malachi 1.4 does. Uh, the little check mark that I got there. This has all taken place in spite of the strong capital of Petra. So the capital of Edom was Petra. Who's heard of Petra in the Bible? We've heard of Petra. Well, what ended up happening was uh, in about AD 636, Petra was captured by Muhammad. Is that interesting? Captured by Muhammad, and shortly after this, Petra and Edom dropped from the pages of history. Who's Muhammad? Who is Muhammad? Muslim prophet, a Muslim prophet. And who did we say Edom or Esau married there? One of the daughters of Ishmael who are those Arab people. And we know that Muhammad came from that line, didn't he? God promised to make them a great nation. We see him still prevalent over in that area today. We give him a couple names. ISIS, I believe, without a doubt. The Jihad. All the Arabs that are there that are warring and fighting, trying to take over the land of Israel. And all those things, you know. You know, the, we're going to talk about Russia a little bit later here. But in the news... Who is Russia taking an alliance with? Syria. Syria. And what, who is Syria controlled by? More of, the, more of the Arabs, right? That ISIS group and all that. that they're, I mean, there's a lot of that that's going on that's controlling it. What is the, what's the leader's name? Kyler, do you remember? Usually he's got them. What's the name of the leader there? I got a picture of him, but I can't. Bashir al-Assad. Al Is that right, Caleb? Two? Oh, you were? Okay. Bashir al-Assad. So al-Assad and his dictatorship and things like that. But there's even war within that, isn't there? War between the two different fractions of what? Of? If you want to say the Arabs or the uh, Islam, there's different fractions and they're fighting with one another too, aren't they? But there's all kinds of disruption. But Russia's taken an alliance with those that are against who? Israel. Against those that are against Israel. Isn't he? And we see the, the things beginning to play out. But we're going to look, look at that a little bit more. But we see in 636, Petra was captured by Muhammad. Shortly after this, Petra and Edom dropped from the pages of Scripture. And we've already said this other point, but remember Edom had mixed with Ishmael. Ishmael was promised to be a nation along with Israel, and they are. They are the Arabs, aren't they? So we know they're a great nation. We know they're doing great things. Uh, not great things, but they're doing great things, big things. Not that they're good things, but they're accomplishing a lot over there in the Middle East. Not, even, not only in the Middle East, but where are they having access to? America? Definitely America aren't they? Got to be careful of the things that are going on. But God promises and he prophesies that Edom or Esau would be gone, but he never says that about Ishmael. He never says that about Ishmael, but that there'll be a great nation, which they are. Now, who knows? Petra will come. We will see Petra again. Future. Who knows what we will see with Pet Petra in the future? Sandy.
Yes, what, what Sandy says is true in, the, in Revelation, the tribulation period. There will be a group of believers, Israel, that will come back. God will use Petra as a place of safety and as a, a hiding place for a while. So we'll see it prevalent again yet future. But today, Petra and Edom have kind of come off the pages of history. Who's ever, if you haven't been studying the Bible a little bit, generally you don't even, you haven't heard of Petra. But if you studied biblical history and all those things, you'll know Petra and what it is. It's gone, but it will be a place for Israel in that tribulation period, a hiding place, like, like Sandy said. I figured Sandy might get that. She's pretty, she listens to a lot of Bible prophecy stuff, I think, all the time. And uh, kind of up, up on those things. Um, I'm going to take in, kind of ending here, just a little bit, this section, uh, the Gentile uh, world power of Edom that's no longer there. Um, it's over in uh, Romans, chapter number 9. I'm going to start in verse uh, verse 4. Romans 9, chapter 9, verse 4. Sorry, I might not have given you the chapter. Romans 9, verse 4. Okay. It begins, and I'll probably read uh, through maybe 13 or so. It says, Who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law? and the service of God and the promises. Who are the fathers and whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Isaac which would be the real nation of Israel, right? That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the promise of God according to election, there's that word election, isn't it? Election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau, what did he say about Esau? I have hated See, some will take this passage right here and say that God loved only Jacob. But God hated Esau. Therefore, in election, or the way one election view that you might have would say that God saves some people and God does what to other people? Damns other people. And this will be a passage that an electionist person will go to. But if you understand, what is, what is Paul talking about here when he says, when he's talking about Jacob and he's talking about Esau? What's he, what did we read back? What did, what did God do with Esau? What did he do to Esau or Edom? He made it desolate, didn't he? So what's he speaking about? Is he speaking of Esau individually? Or what's he speaking about? The nations. He's speaking of nations of people. Did Esau have opportunity? Sure he did. He had opportunity. What did he do with his birthright? He sold it, didn't he? He sold his birthright. He did. did he have to sell his birthright? He didn't have to sell his birthright. He did. It speaks the depth of Esau's heart. 
What did he actually do with the God of Israel? He rejected the God of Israel. He went his own way and became a nation. So he's the one that did that. He's the one that spoke against and fell against God. It is speaking nations, not individual salvation, like some people are going to say. God knew what Edom would be, didn't he? He knew what Edom would be. God knew what Israel would be. But do you notice what we read? Even all Israel didn't do what? When they, when they came up through the, the desert, the land, did everybody in Israel believe? They did not, did they? Did they have an opportunity to believe? They did, just like Esau had an opportunity to believe. So understanding all of what's going on, he's not speaking individual people that when Jacob was born and Esau was born, that God says, I hate you, you've got no opportunity, but I love you and you've got every opportunity. No, God gives opportunity to all men, doesn't he? Is God pleased? God has given the nation Shem, where we get Israel and we get the Arabs. Is God pleased with the Arabs? He's not. But in prophecy, did he promise that they would be a great nation? He did. He did. And in prophecy, what did he prophesy about Edom? They would become desolate. Is God going to do the same thing with the Arabs and how they're treating Israel? Will there be a consequence to them? There will be a consequence to them because of how they're treating. Just not right yet, right? They're, I think they're going to feel some, but there's future things in store that our God is working out through prophecy, that's what we, prophecy we can see some being fulfilled, but some yet not fulfilled quite, quite yet. So anyway, Edom, we can go, you can look at history, you can look at the Bible, you can compare it, it's prophesied in there, but it is fallen from history. Petra's not there, Edom you're not going to find, but it will be prevalent, Petra will anyway, in uh, the future again. And we can trust that what our God says in the word of God is true. Without a doubt, without a doubt, I thank you for it. Let's pray for a minute. Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for taking us into history, Lord, back in Genesis, but also pulling us all the way through, Lord, into the New Testament, even on into the tribulation period with that city of Petra, Lord. We thank you for Sandy, Lord, this morning that has been a, a student of prophecy and loves prophecy, Lord, and listening to truths about that to pull out what Petra is. Father, we thank you for that. We uh, look forward to what you have in store for us in the future, Lord. Look forward to what you have in store for us right here this morning, Lord. In the time that we live in, the dispensation of the church, Lord, where we can come together as a local body and raise up our great Savior. Lord, help us to do it today. And we give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.